uh, we're going to jump right into it. Is that okay, Darlene? Is that all right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So patiently uh, waiting. I want everyone to do me a huge favor. You're more than welcome to do this. I'm going to put this up on the screen now. This is the website that you can go to and get a great deal of information from and will give you great insight in regards to Darlene and who she is and what she's all about. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about necessarily who Darlene is and what she's all about, but I want to get to the number of books that you have uh, published. How many altogether? Well, now it's 10. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Three paperbacks and wow, seven. Wow, wow. And yeah. by the way, my website is what is codependency.com. Yes, it, it is indeed that. Matter of fact, just uh, for the record, let me go ahead and do that while I'm thinking about it. Uh, I've got that uh, up here for you. It's right here. So this is the website. I need everybody to go to this website. I need you to take the time to invest in your mental health, especially during Mental Health Month, month of May. But connect with Darlene. Uh, you, you will not regret it. My daughters love uh, your book. Uh, it is still one of their go-to books when they're, uh, when they're uh, reviewing information, your codependency book. Uh, your other books cover a number of different things. So I'm going to put a few things up on the screen. I just mentioned to you, I've been researching you deeply, even more than before the past mm -hmm. two weeks. Uh, so I'm going to put certain phrases that are from your book and feel free to expound on them and explain some of them. Uh, for Great idea. Uh, let's I go from that. there. Go is, is that okay? First, I, I was trying to, uh, another thing I wanted to do before we get into it, everybody, I need everybody to also do me a favor. I need you to do this. Go here. Uh, I, I really hope, especially you viewers and supporters of our channel and subscribers, I need you to follow her Instagram page. Please show your love for her and show her some love on her uh, YouTube channel as well. Uh, under the same name, if I'm not mis remember correctly. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, please show some love, love to uh, my guests, all of them. But today, the lady of the day, the diva of the day is Darlene. Show some love to her for that. Um, well, here we go. Of course, your name is attached to this word, but mm -hmm. as as succinct and as concise and briefly as possible, explain this for the viewers, many of them just beginning their journey. What is codependency? Okay, well, there is no one definition. No one could really agree. There are a lot of theor theorists, <laughs> theorists <laughs> over the last like 30, 40 years. Um, mm -hmm. And my definition is that it's when someone who can't access their innate uh, feelings and thoughts, uh, and then instead their thinking and behavior revolves around someone else or something else, because uh, addicts are codependent too, whether it's a substance or a process like gambling or sex addiction. Mm -hmm. Underneath is codependency, and so all of their thinking behavior revolves around something external to themselves. Okay. Now, since that's the case, what, uh, and again, these are words from all of your books that mm -hmm. I was able to access, uh, which I went up to eight. Uh, so I missed it. <laughs> so, so, so man, I thought I was on it. Okay. So here we go. Another word, please expound on this word. That's in uh, actually one of your main books that you uh, have a great book, the word shame. Okay. Well, yeah, I wrote a whole book about shame. And yeah. interestingly, it is what links codependence and narcissism. It's underneath both disorders. And that's, and I can go into more how that gets manifest and expressed. But shame is a very painful uh, emotion, affect. And where self esteem is more how you think about yourself, shame is more of a feeling. And it's, profoundly painful because you're alienated not just from other people but all of the positive aspects of yourself so you just feel like you're all bad inferior inadequate uh it could take a specific trait like um unattractive i'm not smart enough i'm not successful enough i'm too fat or this or that but mm -hmm. you could focus on one subject Okay. or one trait, mm -hmm. but underneath is, uh, if you really want to look at the bottom line, it's not feeling lovable. Okay. You might be not feeling likable. And that, 
that that likable and lovable is a, is a, that word lovable you you also mentioned that in in a couple of your books right. uh i just i'm going to talk about it maybe a little bit more if we get a chance to but mm -hmm. why is it important that a person feels lovable especially if if their caregivers or parents didn't give them that okay well first of all a parent telling you they love you is not enough they need to want to have uh, a relationship with you. They have to be interested in you and not just for what you achieve or how you um, perform to their liking, but for who you are as an individual, separate and apart from their goals and aspirations for you. So in other words, loving the authentic you, if it's not that, it's conditional love. And that creates all kinds of problems because then you're, constantly having to achieve and to perform, to feel good enough, but it's never enough. And so, and it has to come from both parents, that they're interested in you for who you are, that they want a relationship with you. That tells a child that they're loved. And if they don't get that, they never feel good about themselves inside. Uh, they carry around this shame. Most of the time, for many people, it's unconscious. Uh, they may glimmers of it mm -hmm. and then it's hard to get into a relationship and feel loved because you don't feel worthy of it you don't feel worthy of receiving this is very common with codependence they're used to giving and they think if they give and give and give then it'll be returned but it doesn't work that way mm -hmm. they attract a narcissist or just someone who's selfish and they don't get their needs met half the time they don't even know or value their needs because they don't feel worthy. Hmm. It's just the symptoms go on and on and on. But you, if you are abusing yourself, you're going to attract abuse. And most people don't even realize how abusive they are with themselves, the way they talk to themselves, the way they treat themselves. So the, the antidote is self-love in the end. It's an inside job. You can't get it from the outside or someone else. Searching outside of oneself is not going to give it to a person. They need to as you put it, have this self-love, it's an inside job. But then I'm going to put this word up. What if they're dealing with this then? Denial. Uh -huh. Right. That's a trait of addiction and codependency. Uh -huh. and it's a defense that narcissists use. It's a defense to shame. I was in denial of my own shame for many years. Wow. Um, it came to me in a dream huh. that there was a woman named shame and I needed to get to know her. <laughs> Okay. so that's pretty good and at the time i was teaching about self-esteem i was going to ask you uh, yeah what time of your life was that uh, how many a few decades ago okay. i can't quite remember but yeah. i ended up i went into psychoanalysis and i really worked on this issue so um so denial helps us survive so we might be in an abusive relationship and not realize it, because if we really face it, then we'd have to do something about it. So codependents are in denial of their feelings often. Some people are aware of their feelings. They have a head start. Hmm. Uh, in denial of their needs, denial of their wants, because if they weren't honored and recognized as a child, uh, then they don't learn that they have value. It's part of having worth. That It's not just because... I am a good student or because I do what my parents say that I'm a good girl or a nice boy, a good boy. It's because my needs have value. My feelings have value. My wants have value. And oftentimes parents ignore or shame a child's needs and feelings. Uh, you shouldn't feel that way or mm -hmm. they don't listen. They don't have time. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times shaming is unintentional. It's not because they're telling you, oh, I wish you'd never been born and the horrible things that some parents say or they're, they're beating you or abusing you physically or in some other way. They might just be too busy or too self-centered or they have a marital stress, or financial stress, and they don't have time to really focus on the children. So, But making sure that our needs are met it still would be up on us to make sure that we're doing the inner work, especially if we, if we become adults, it may become challenging, of course, if, a person, if it's a child, 
but a person still, you're saying, has to work on their self-worth. They have to be able to identify. Well, there's some part of that is identifying your needs. Okay. So, you know, if you feel down, let's say, you might not realize, first of all, you might not even recognize it or be able to name it. So a lot of people can't name their feelings. They just say, I'm upset. Well, okay. it doesn't tell me if you're angry That's or sad. A lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Or guilty, and it doesn't. I don't really know what that means. And so, be able to actually name your feelings is important. I list in the Dummies book about two hundred feelings, mm-hmm. and basically, there's like sad, mad, glad, afraid, mm-hmm. um, guilty, and then there's variations and combinations. Shame is like guilt and sadness together, and so being able to name them, and then you have to ask yourself, what do I need? So at growing up, a parent, uh, if they're a good parent, will empathize with you and tell you, oh, Johnny, you're feeling sad. Mm-hmm. Here, I can see that you're sad. I understand. And maybe give them a hug. Or you're afraid. And I see that you're afraid. And let me talk to you about that and what you can do to not feel afraid. So is a combination of empathy and help. So I tell people and my clients, I say, you know, name your feeling out loud. This is very helpful. Research has shown this. And call yourself by name. So I'd say, oh, Darlene, you're feeling resentful. You know, name it. Call yourself by name. And then say, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And then add on, you're angry, you're sad, you're guilty, whatever it is, and it's okay. Because most people don't think their feelings are okay. I shouldn't be angry. I should have gotten over that. I shouldn't be sad anymore. I should be happy. Look at all the things I have in my life. I should be happy. And they keep shaming. That's shaming. So feelings can get shamed. And needs can get shamed. And then you deny and then you deny them. Because why feel a need if it's not going to get satisfied? Or why feel a pain if no one's going to comfort you? If the feelings and the shame, excuse me, if the feelings and the needs get shamed and that becomes uh, something that they experience maybe from a caregiver, we're talking about this could become a lifestyle then based upon what you're saying. A person could have a lifestyle of their feelings and their needs being shamed so they don't even really understand what they are, let let alone speak up. That's right. So they end up getting in relationships where their needs aren't met and they don't even know. And they don't even care. <laughs> they're just meeting the needs of the other person and thinking, unconsciously thinking that they're going to get their needs met. With a narcissist, it's a bottomless pit. Yeah. <laughs> they're never going to no. be sad. Because they have shame underneath. And they're out of touch with all of their vulnerable feelings and their emotional needs. So they choose someone who's more empathetic and char- and in touch with their feelings. And you kind of supply that for them. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now you said the you said the V word, vulnerable. Another word you use uh, mm-hmm. in your books. Uh, I have a list of stuff here. Uh, I'm, right. I know right. I'm not going to care. No, no, I'm not. Gonna, I don't want to sound like a stalker either. I just want you to know. I'm going to clarify that because we're really not that far from each other. <laughs> so no, I'm not stalking you. But you, I'm going to put it up. Here you go. You said the V word, vulnerable. So honesty and vulnerable. I noticed throughout uh, your books. These are very interesting qualities and traits that need to come into play. How do these two words come into play when it's a narcissist or when it's a codependent? Wow. <laughs> we can spend a lot more on that. I know. I know. Okay. But we can't. We're going. Okay. We're, we're so, just going to have to run a series of shows. I don't know. Because this okay. is That's okay. so much in your books. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm amped up. Go ahead. Yeah, good. Um, so the antidote to shame is authenticity. Okay, so let's talk about the codependent. And by the way, I think that narcissists are codependent too. I wrote a blog about that. Yeah. I have a chapter in my book where I go through all of the traits and symptoms of codependency, and I compare the narcissist and the codependent one for one. They often manifest differently, but underneath, they're the same. So many codependents have difficulty being honest and vulnerable. 
So if you're denying your feelings, then you can't be vulnerable. You can't express them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then there's people who are aware of their needs and their feelings, but they don't feel entitled to them. So they don't feel like they have a right to them. Like it would be selfish if I asked for that. Right, right. right. Or if it would be feel humiliating to ask for more attention. Mm -hmm. So that when they get involved with a narcissist who takes up the whole room and they're always like feeding the narcissist Mm -hmm. or focusing on someone like an addict who needs a lot of attention too. Mm -hmm. uh, And they put their needs aside so that you have to be able to identify them, name them, and then give them value. And then to express them to be vulnerable. So I remember many years ago, I went to a workshop. And uh, being a risk taker, (laughs) I volunteered to be like in the center of this group of like 30 people. And at one point, something came up, which I don't remember. And I asked the facilitator, I said, uh, I guess I was feeling very vulnerable or something. And I said, I really need a hug from this woman. And she said, well, she said, darling, you're going to have to ask for it. And I was like, oh, my God, (laughs) that was really hard. And it felt um, like another level of shame Uh, because that would be really vulnerable. It's one thing to say, I need it. But then to ask and maybe someone say no, that puts you, that's being more vulnerable. Okay. So after the workshop, a lot of people came over and said, oh, you really know yourself. That was like so great that you were able to say, I need a hug. And yet, you know, that leader thought I need to take it to the next step in a way she was shaming me, but because she wasn't uh, honoring my need, but it was a lesson for me nonetheless. Now, so you have to know them. Then you have to take the risk. Then it requires something else. Probably is on your list. Assertiveness. (laughs) So how did you do that? Let's no seriously. (laughs) We're, we're, we're like a few hours away from it. How in the world did you just do that? It is further down my list, but now I don't have to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, to be honest and to be vulnerable, you have to be assertive. You have to yeah. be able to make I statements instead of saying you're so selfish. <laughs> like someone yeah. would say to a narcissist, you have to say, I need X or Y from you. You have to take ownership of it. Again, that means... Uh, feeling entitled instead of ashamed of your needs. (laughs) You know, you could look at narcissistic codependence like um, on a seesaw or the flip side of one another. Mm -hmm. So whereas a narcissist feels overly entitled compared to everybody else, codependents don't have enough sense of entitlement. They don't ask for their needs. They waive their needs all the time. They don't want to make waves, so Mm -hmm. they give them up. So that means having the cur and courage to be vulnerable and having the words, again, I statements, assertiveness. And then you have to realize that your partner may or may not, or friend may or may not accommodate that. And then you can negotiate or be okay with it. But codependent relationships, no one takes I statements. They're always pointing the finger and saying, you didn't do this or you never do that. And nobody wants to take a position. Hmm. And so they keep blaming each other. <laughs> it doesn't get, no one's needs get met. And they nothing, have to say, nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. Yeah. What movie do you want to see? I don't know. What do you want to see? <laughs> Where do you want to eat? Where are we going to know? Where do you want to go? Just to the codependents, and then they're stuck in the they're they're stuck on the street. They never left the house. Or, and then or they the car. Want, and nothing then they gets done. Blame each other. Like, yeah. Oh, like, well, why don't you? I asked you. Why don't you say? You know. And then you go. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's that's like a skit from Seinfeld. This just goes on and on. Right. Okay. Um, so now on the narcissist side. Wait one second. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Please. Yeah. The narcissist side. The most. Um, the worst thing that they feel shame about is looking weak because for them, I just had another thought. Oh, I'll go come back to for them. <laughs> Look, this is why you were, you were so good the first time around. And everybody said, Paxton, why do you need two hours? I said, that woman has to, 
she has to she has to do other things she can't be with us all day no go ahead please <laughs> yeah, for thoughts, yeah they prioritize power okay and will sacrifice the relationship to get it so wow and my yeah. book is all about changing this dynamic and the mm-hmm. the codependent or the partner or the friend or prioritizes the relationship and will sacrifice themselves to keep it. So you have the narcissist prioritizing power and their partner prioritizing the relationship. So what does that mean? Usually uh, a codependent feels a lot of shame if they're called selfish, if they're called uncaring, uh, anything that is like the opposite of being a good partner, (laughs) uh, a loving partner. Yeah. And relationship skills, relationship values. On the other hand, a narcissist feels the most shame if you call them weak. Uh-huh. Because they want to be on top. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a codependent uh, will uh, waive their rights, waive their needs. They want to um, don't make waves to get along. A narcissist doesn't care about getting along. They want to get ahead. They want to be on top. Uh-huh. So being vulnerable with their feelings, this makes intimacy very hard for them, is something that they don't want to do. They don't want to be open. They don't want to be vulnerable. Uh, Instead, they might go on the attack or they'll withdraw. That's one of the um, dynamics in relationships. And I go into this in my book on shame, that usually when someone feels shame, they either withdraw or attack. And you can also look at this as a primal reaction, like a trauma reaction, fight or flight. Mm-hmm. And it, often they'll just attack themselves. Right. There you have another Well, I told you, I got, I got tons of stuff. You're right. my mind. You're, okay. I'm not quick enough to put each one up as you go, because you're hitting all these points. I'm, I see my outline right here of the show, and you're just hitting all of them. I understand. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do want to ask you about this one. 